Recording in progress. Assalamu alaikum Abu Farid, can you hear? All right, come when you guys log in, please make sure your microphones are on mute. Okay, give me one second. <clears throat> Trying to get uh, Instagram Live on. Okay, alhamdulillah, ya rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fi al-akhirati hasana, wa qina adab al-nar. O Allah, we ask you for the good of this life and the good of the hereafter, and to save us from the hellfire. O Allah, Rabbana, uh, Rabbana zidna ilman, Nafi'an, O oh Allah, increase us with beneficial knowledge. O oh Allah, we ask you to grant us sincerity as we embark on this journey to learn uh, about this uh, very important topic. So tonight's discussion, which hopefully we, uh, I hope to have every Tuesday, inshallah ta'ala, I will be reading from my book, The Revolution of Love. A Revolution of Love. A man's perspective on loving multiple women in a non-traditional marriage, i.e. polygyny. So what prompted me to read from this book was, you know, I've, I've read from the book before and I will roll the book club uh, a couple years ago. Alhamdulillah, we actually completed the entire book. But what prompted me to kind of take a, another look at the book is... Uh, you oftentimes hear a lot of people um, talking about polygyny. You know, we hear a lot of discussions about polygyny. And as a result of those discussions, um, sometimes people, you know, speak about the, the subject of uh, polygyny from, you know, a knowledge base perspective. Sometimes they're speaking uh, about polygyny based upon their experiences. And sometimes they are speaking about it, you know, without any knowledge. <laughs> and what happens is that it confuses, it confuses the masses um, about the subject of polygyny. I don't know what's going on with uh, my Instagram, but for some reason it's not letting me on. So if you can let everybody that's on Instagram know that um, they will have to come to um, they will have to come to Facebook uh, to join the discussion. I don't I don't know what's going on on, Facebook, on Instagram. Uh, it seems like every single time I try to um, you know try to do something, something goes wrong. Can't access something. Uh, it seems to be that way all the time. So let me see if I can just disconnect this real quick.
Okay, so um, many of you guys may be uh, familiar with the subject of polygyny. Some of you may be, some of you might not be, uh, and that's fine um, because I'm, I'm not reading from this book uh, with the intention of encouraging anybody to uh, marry into polygyny. That's, that's not the purpose of this discussion. That's not the reason why I wrote the book. I actually wrote the book from a man's perspective to give women a deeper you know, uh, understanding or a deeper dive into the male psychology and why, you know, just to kind of give them a reason to uh, you give them a deeper understanding as to some of the reasons why a man wants to marry a second wife or wants to take on a second family. And the reason why it's imperative for women to understand or gain a deeper understanding is so that she doesn't end up invalidating herself. A lot of times when a man chooses to marry into polygyny, women oftentimes will look at themselves and say, well, if he wants another wife, then obviously that means that I am not enough. I obviously am not sufficient. Um, and that's not the case. You know, that's not the case at all. All right. That's that's not the reason why a man is marrying another wife. I mean, we'll get into all of that, but that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. Another reason that prompted me to write the book was there there were little to no uh, writings. I mean, you've heard imams and students of knowledge, you know, speak briefly about the subject of polygyny, never really much in, in detail. But you'll hear a lecture here and there. You'll hear, you know, a sidebar comment here and there. Nothing extensive, at least based upon my knowledge. Out of all of the years that I have been Muslim, I have yet to hear an extensive series on the subject of polygyny from a knowledge-based perspective. And I mean, if you guys know of something, whether written or, you know, a series of lectures on YouTube or uh, any other platform, then please share it with me because um, before I wrote this book, I looked out into the atmosphere to see what was out there, see who had written extensively. And most of the, the most that I could find was books that were written by women. Actually, what agitated me and prompted me at the same time to write this book was that I walked into Barnes and Nobles one day and uh, I went to the religious section and I saw that there were a few books written on polygyny, right? And those books were written by women. Those books were written by women. And obviously written from a woman's perspective, uh, it's going to be loaded with, you know, a lot of emotion, a lot of, you know, pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of, you know, you're not going to really get a balanced approach in many regards because, if a woman is writing from that perspective, a woman's perspective, she's either writing because she had, you know, a, either a horrible experience with it or a positive experience with it. And whether a positive experience or a negative experience is still from one or two, one of those two experiences. And that still misses the balance that I'm, you know, that I, I tried to strike with writing this. All right. So from a man's perspective is why I included that in the subtitle, right? It doesn't look like uh, Instagram is going to have. Um, doesn't look like Instagram is going to have this today. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what's going on. I've tried, I've tried. Hmm. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start with the introduction to the book. If if any of you um if any of you uh guys are um have the book, uh you can follow along uh that I'm going to be reading from um yeah, there's something wrong with Instagram and it's Funny that it, it happens that way as I'm getting ready to go live. All right, so I'm just going to put a post out and let everybody know they can come to Facebook.
Please make sure your microphones are muted, inshallah. Okay, so I'm going to start on page 12. I'm going to start with the introduction of the book and uh, it'll take a few, you know, it'll take a few classes before we kind of get into the book. I don't want to just kind of jump into it. I know that everybody wants to, you know, get into the meat and potatoes of, of the of the subject. Uh, but uh, we want to kind of slow walk ourselves into this. Um, okay. Oh, it looks like it's working now. Okay, it's working. All right. So I'm going to begin with the introduction. We're on page 12, inshallah. For those of you who have the book, we're reading from the book, The Revolution of Love, A Man's Perspective on Loving Multiple Women and a Non-Traditional Marriage. All right, so what I would like you guys to do is to hold your comments. Uh, hold your comments, hold your, your sidebar conversations uh, based upon your previous experiences with polygyny or friends that you know who have been in polygyny. I'm, I'm not here to get into all of that. Please don't ask me any hypotheticals about, or what if a brother did this, or what if a person did that, because nine times out of ten, and I can say this with full conviction, nine times out of ten, the, the, all of the examples, the hypotheticals that you bring me are going to be from situations and people who were practicing polygyny who had absolutely no knowledge of polygyny. I can guarantee you that. Most of them, before they involved themselves into polygyny, Never read a book on polygyny cover to cover, never did any extensive research, whether from a cultural perspective or from an Islamic perspective or historical perspective, because polygyny predates Islam, for those of you who didn't know. OK, so I begin. This is my introduction. When I reflect on the emotional and cognitive framework of polygyny. I'm often reminded of the intimate yet mysterious relationship between a boy and his mother. Although the dichotomy of these two relationships may, may appear a bit uncanny at first glance, but when you consider the fact that the mother is the first woman with whom the male child falls in love, it makes total sense. She, is un she undoubtedly lends to his feelings of self-worth confidence while filling his emotive abyss with maternal love, compassion, and intimacy, all of which are necessary ingredients for the emotional stability he will need to navigate the sea of interpersonal relationships, uh, interpersonal relationship challenges he will face later on in his life. All right. So basically the first paragraph, I'm jumping right into it. And what I'm saying here, if I had to summarize what I'm saying is that the relationship between a boy and his mother is the beginning, the first step of the male's understanding of women. So I had to start there. All right. It's very important that we understand that. So when you look at if you are a woman in polygyny or you are a man in polygyny, understand that the decision to do that, a lot of it has to do with the relationship between him and his mother. I promise you, it may not look like that on the surface, but if you peel back a few layers, you will see it, he will see it. There is no wonder that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the first woman, Hawa, Eve, from the rib of Adam, he strategically placed all of man's emotional needs within her. Her existence is essentially the key component by which man finds himself whole and complete. You understand? A man can have all the money in the world. A man can have all the resources in the world. A man can have a huge mansion, can have a, you know, a nice, luxurious foreign cars. He can have all of that. But he is incomplete without a woman by his side. That is a fact. That is a, that is a religious fact. And that is you know, a fact that we understand, you know, by our experiences as men. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in surah number 31, ayah 21. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and from his signs is that he created for you men, from you men, spouses, so that you may find tranquility, you may find peace, 
لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Allah uses the word Sakina. This is where the word Sakina comes from. This is also where the word house comes from. Because Sa or Sin, Kaf, Nun, which are the root letters, Sekina. The word for house in Arabic is Sekin. Because that's where you are to find your Sakina. That's where you are to find your tranquility. That's where you are to find your peace at home. Right? And he created for you, from you, spouses, mates, that you may find tranquility in them. And he placed between you both mercy and compassion. Indeed, and this is a sign for people who reflect. This male-female dynamic constitutes one half of the dual nature that many human beings struggle to find a balance with their entire lives. We're talking about the balance between the physical and the emotional. There are many people who struggle to find a balance between those two. Some people are either just completely physical and everything is dealt with on a physical level, logical, and then there are those who deal with the emotion. And then there are some people who, you know, everything is emotionally charged. Everything is, you know, based on how I feel emotionally, both men and women for that matter. We like to think that women are the ones who are extremely emotional, not in today's time. In today's time, men might have, you know, men might hold the championship belt as the most emotional in today's time. And that is part and parcel because many of us were raised by women. We were raised in matriarchal homes, female dominated environments. So we kind of take on some of that energy. Boys tend to look towards their mothers for the maternal attention that fathers can never gratify. A father can never, can I, I'm not going to say he can never, but to the degree that a woman can, a father will never be able to cater to the son emotionally. That's not our nature as men. Our nature as men is not to you know, be there emotionally and cater to the child, the male child. That's not our nature because we're hunters. So we're, we're raising the boys to have some level of personal fortitude. And in order for that to happen, he has to have some thick skin. He has, we have to be able to teach him how to endure and to tolerate. And for our daughters, you know, when they're emotionally charged or emotionally, you know, compromised, we try to be there with them in the moment to help them process their emotions. But with boys, although we should help them process their emotions as well, that's usually not what happens. That's usually not what happens. But boys tend to look to their mothers for the maternal attention that fathers can never gratify. Consequently, the male child who is deprived of this paternal connection during early childhood years will, in due course, explore different avenues, sometimes to his own emotional demise, until he finds a way to mollify them. So when a boy is not, so what I'm saying is that when a boy is not shown that maternal attention from his mom, he will eventually go through life seeking that maternal attention through other avenues. And sometimes those avenues are not necessarily healthy. Sometimes those avenues will, you know, destroy him. You think about a boy who wants to be in a relationship with a girl, right? Wants a girlfriend right out of fifth, sixth grade, right? He, he wants a girlfriend, right? So this is the, the, the young boy that is very thirsty. Any girl who shows him attention he is all, you know, he's, he, she has his full attention, right? Any girl who shows him attention, it doesn't matter what she looks like, just simply on the basis that she showed him some attention. There are men who still do that to this day right now. Any woman who inquires about him, he's having a sit down with her. He doesn't, you know, discern based upon his priorities, his preferences, his likes, his dislikes. No, she asked about me. She inquired about me. She's interested in me and she has my full attention. Tell me I'm lying. There's some brothers right now who will have a sit down with any woman who shows him attention. There's some of our young boys right now in grammar school, in, in grade school, in, high, in middle school, high school, any girl who shows him any type of attention, he's all game. He's all game. Guys, when you come in, please make sure you mute your microphones. You know, 
And the reason why, a large part of the reason why they do that is because they are missing that maternal attention at home. If mom was showing him adequate attention at home, there would not be this pressing need to seek female attention in school or in their own social circles. You guys follow me? So a lot of times the reason why boys do that is because they are attention starved, right? Being loved by multiple women, whether in the construct of polygyny or in a cycle of serial monogamous relationships. Polygyny is the closest that I've seen men come to satisfying the emotional neglect created in their adolescence. I mean, you think about it, a, a boy who grows up, grows up, growing up, his mother never showed him much attention. I remember when myself and Hassan Clay, we were having some men's group a couple of years ago. We were doing like a, a men's uh, retreat online. And one of the brothers, you know, kind of disclosed the fact that, you know, he was very good at basketball or very good at football. I'm forgetting which sport it was. And every time he looked out into the bleachers, he was always looking for his mom to be there. But his mother was never there. His mother was never there. And this, you know, continuous, you know, cycle of the absentee mom. And that's not, there's no blame necessarily on the mom. I'm not speaking from the perspective of blaming the mother. I'm just, you know, diagnosing, you know, the behavior that is the result of the mom being absent. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to show you where a lot of the behavior comes from. And he confirmed that his mom not being there, him always looking for his mom to be there, that support from his mother and his mother not being there. This is a lot of times what drives men to either have this, you know, this unhealthy cycle of serial monogamous relationships or polygyny. Either or they're getting the maternal, they're getting the, the womanly attention that they that they didn't get from their moms when they were children. In my personal, my own personal experience, growing up as an African American and estranged from the emotional attention of my own mother, I found that many men under circumstances parallel to mine engaged in a series of monogamous relationships with women, possibly searching for the same maternal sympathy and attention. I didn't, I didn't grow up with my mother. I grew up in a foster home. So, any home that I was in, and I went from multiple foster homes until I was placed at a particular home where I spent, you know, the majority of, you know, my childhood until I reunited with my mother in the early part of my teenage years. So it doesn't matter what home I was in, even though there was maternal attention in terms of uh, my foster mother buying clothes for me, you know, helping me with homework or, you know, getting me off to school. It still was not my mother. So any attention that was given was not appreciated. You know, obviously at that time, I, I didn't even know what it meant to appreciate. I didn't even know what that meant because that wasn't the maternal attention that I was looking for. I was looking for my mother. It's like, yeah, you know, you're showing me attention, but I don't want your attention. I'm looking for my mom. Where's my mother? Why isn't my mother here? Why isn't my mother showing me attention? Right? And I found that men under similar circumstances, uh, they engage in a series of monogamous relationship with women searching for the same maternal attention. And I'm, I'm speaking from a personal experience. You know, sixth grade, seventh grade, you know, you got multiple girlfriends and, you know, that kind of validates you. It makes you feel whole. It makes you feel, you know, you're satisfying the void that's there. Albeit you're doing it in an unhealthy way. But in your mind, you're, you believe that the more women that, you know, I got, the more women that I have, you know, that I claim as my girlfriends, you know, the more of a man I feel, you know, the more like a man I feel. Right here again, as African Americans, we have been taught, we have been, you know, um, nurtured into thinking that our manhood is measured, is quantified by way of, or is measured by way of how many girls we have. Right, and there's a reason behind that, you know. I can recall periods in my life where almost everything we did as pubescent males in the inner cities of New Jersey was to win the attention of girls. 
everything that we did was about getting the attention of a girl. This became so common that rudimentary activities like going to school eventually had little to do with education and more to do with the attention of the opposite sex. That's a fact. Any man who is honest with you will tell you high school was about the attention that you got from girls. I did not go to high school for an education. I did not go to high school so that I could, you know, become an engineer or I could become like, I didn't have those type of aspirations. <laughs> you know, by the time I hit high school, I was already in the streets. And going to high school was just a formality to keep my mother quiet, <laughs> to shut my mother up. But going to high school was about, you know, who's going to be there? What are you wearing tomorrow? You know, this was, you know, in the early 90s, 91, 92, Polo was out, you know, you, you wearing Polo, Levi's, you know, Timberland boots, Jordans. Like th this was like if you had that gear, you had the attention of everybody. Right. If you lived in the North, New Jersey, East Orange, Montclair, you lived in the Essex County area. You're talking about 300 Z's. You're talking about Omni's with hatchback with, you know, uh, I mean, to the end of it. And every hood had their own. You know, had their own trinkets by which men, you know, could gain the attention of women, you know. Um, but those were, you know, that's what it was about. Going to school, you know, Sergio Tacchini, right? Exactly. No, Lee Jeans was kind of out of, it was Levi's in the 90s. Lee's, Lee's were done in the 80s. Um, sweatsuits, you know, you had um, Nordica, you know, Nordica, Polo. You, you had all of the brands. If you had those clothes on, you know, you were going to school to get the attention of the girls. That was a fact. So you had those of us who were, you know, playing ball. I, I wasn't necessarily a ball player, but I was a dresser. You know, understand? So you had those who played ball, those who, you know, basketball players, football players, jocks. They got the girls. And a lot of times they did that, you know, not necessarily to get the girls, but that was a perk that came along with it. And that was a given. And then you had those who could dress, you had those who sold drugs, you had, but all of it was based upon the attention that you were going to get from the women in school, from the girls at school. Aristotle, he said something very profound. He conceptualized this dynamic in a, in a phrase. He said, if women didn't exist, all the money in the world would have no meaning. Go figure. Aristotle, he said that if women didn't exist, all of the money in the world would have no meaning. Why else do men strive to become millionaires, billionaires, drive foreign cars, drive you know fancy cars and live in big homes? Why else do we do that? Do we do that so we can go home alone and just sit in, you know, in the comfort of our living room with our socks on and just stare out, you know, stare out into the horizon? Or, or do we do that so that we could, you know, help boost, you know, you know, help boost our self-esteem and bolster our, you know, um, you know, inflate, you know, our profile in front of women? Absolutely. The way we dress, the type of vehicles we drove, etc. were all predicated on the attention we presumed we would get from girls most of the time because it was not given unconditionally at home. Unconditionally. And the reason why I say, and if you have the book, highlight that sentence because... The reason why I say love was not given unconditionally at home is because for many of us, I can speak from my own experiences, as I've said before, love was only shown when, um, you know, good behavior was part of the equation. Love was not given, you know, in the foster home that I grew up in, love was not given at least. Let me be balanced with this. Love obviously has different manifestations. Right? The, the fact that someone is providing a roof over your head is showing you love. The fact that someone goes to the grocery store and buys food for you, that's you know showing you love. The fact that you have clothes on your back and you know shoes on your feet is showing you love, right? So I'm not dismissing that. But then there's another manifestation of love that children require, and that is through attention. You know, paying attention to the person, not just giving them attention when they do something wrong, but giving them attention, you know, 
even when they do something wrong, even when they do something wrong and when they do something right. I remember my foster mother, I, this was the one time in my entire life that I got honor roll, right? I don't know what was going on in my life at that time that prompted me to, you know, exert myself academically, but this was the one time in my life, I guess I, I wanted to test, you know, my foster parents to see that, you know, if I got honor roll, would I get the same amount of attention that, you know, maybe my foster sister got, you know, because she got a lot of attention. So I guess I was just pushing myself to see, you know, if I could get, and then I come home with my report card and it's like all, you know, it's like two A's and like maybe six B's, you know, and uh, I showed the report card to my foster mother and I said, you know, I, I finally got honor roll. She said, I'm happy for you. She said, but uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, you know, overly, you know, excited about it. She said, you know, you do so much bad that it overshadows the little bit of good that you do do. And man, I was broken. Like it literally knocked the wind out of me. I remember those words like it was yesterday. And, and that's not to justify, you know, um, any of the wrong that I did. I was, I was bad as a kid, you know what I mean? But I was troubled. I had a troubled spirit. I had a troubled soul as a kid. I had a unique set of circumstances, you know? So it wasn't like, you know, I had, you know, dual parent home and, you know, live in the suburbs and, you know, I, I, you know, had a great upbringing and I still managed to, you know, screw all of that up. No, I was a troubled soul from the very beginning, from the very beginning. But, um, in many instances, attention was one dimensional in a lot of homes and only shown when inappropriate behavior was part of the equation. Oh, when I did something wrong, I got suspended. I did something wrong. Oh, the whole entire night was focused on me. She's on the phone with other family members. She's on the phone with friends. You know, you know what this boy just did, you know, and although I'm upstairs in my room on punishment, I can hear all the conversations on the phone and she calling this one and calling that one. And, you know, I feel like there's, there's a part of me, although on punishment in my room, although on punishment in my room, I can hear my name coming up in multiple conversations. That's the only time you get attention is when you do something wrong. You know, so if you think about that, the only time that we get attention is when we do something wrong. This is what creates that bad boy mentality that I'm going to go out in the neighborhood and I'm going to be rough and tough and I'm going to do things. I'm going to smoke weed at 13 and 14. They're probably smoking it younger than that now, but I'm going to smoke weed at 13, 14. I'm going to sag my pants and I'm going to show my underwears and, you know, I'm going to unlace my sneakers and walk with my sneakers, you know, flopping off my feet. I'm going to turn my cat backwards. All of this is to draw the attention. Because we have been prepped, we have been nurtured, cultured at home that the only time this kid gets attention is when he's doing something negative, when he's doing something bad. So parents, be mindful of the type of attention that you are giving your children. Are you over, over emphasizing their behavior when they do something wrong, but kind of tucking it under the prayer rug when they do something right? It should be the total opposite. We have to be mindful of the type of messages that we are sending our children. Do we go overboard when they do something wrong so as to make them believe that the only time that we give them any attention is when they do something wrong? That's a horrible message to send a child. And the same, same could be said for the other end of the spectrum where young African-American boys are oftentimes smothered by unconditional attention. So let's look at the other end of the spectrum, right? Let's look at the other end of the spectrum where the child is smothered with attention by the mom or by other women in the home, right? For appropriate as well as inappropriate behaviors with the scarcity of an older responsible male being commonplace. There's no man in the home. And so, you know, that's my little man, you know, he's my husband, this is the man of the house, 
Um, meanwhile, you know, his behaviors, you know, and this is the type of kid that can never do any wrong. His mom will be there to defend him right, wrong or indifferent. It doesn't matter. She never checks him. And even when she does check him, um, it's, it's just a slap on the wrist, but it doesn't send the message that the behavior is intolerable or the behavior is unacceptable. You understand the constant coddling and overindulging of single mothers and other female family members creates an insatiable appetite for womanly attention, a craving that is destined to be regulated in Islam by the institution of polygyny. I'm not implying that men who opt for polygyny do so purely out of a personal insecurity created by a lack of maternal attention in their adolescence or too much of it for that matter. However, the odds of it playing a role in the decision of many Muslim men to marry into polygyny, whether they are conscious of it or not, is highly probable. Highly probable. So I'm not saying that men opt for polygyny because they were neglected, you know, by their mothers in their adolescence, or they were smothered and given too much attention by their mothers. But the fact that it might play a part it's highly probable. It's highly probable. You got to think, if the mom is always giving, like, <clears throat> this is especially true if the, he's the only boy and there's all girls in the house or, you know, the, there's two boys and, you know, they're, they're you know, whatever. You give me any scenario. But sometimes women will overindulge the sons. And it creates this insatiable craving for womanly attention. We give them nicknames. Oh, boo-boo. Look at boo-boo. Everybody got a boo-boo in every hood, right? Ra-ra. Look at little ra-ra. You know, little boo-boo. A little this, little that. You know, and mom calls him by this nickname. You know, the other girls in the family call him by that nickname. You know, Girls in his neighborhood call him by that nickname and, you know, that's what he's known as in that neighborhood. And that's, you know, the girl's way of showing him that attention. John Lee, and I want you guys to grab this book because it's very important. John Lee wrote a best-selling book entitled Breaking the Mother-Son Dynamic. Resetting the Patterns of a Man's Love and Loves. That's the name of his book. For you mothers that are, you know, handling your business by yourself, very little to no male presence in the life of your sons, I want you to read this book. Grab this book. You can go to Barnes & Noble. You can go to, you know, Amazon. Grab the book. The, the author's name is John Lee. The title of the book is called Breaking the Mother-Son Dynamic. Breaking the Mother-Son Dynamic. Resetting the Patterns of a Man's Love and Loves. He has a chapter called Adult Sons Searching for Mothering in Other Women. Pay attention to the chapter title. This gets deep. This book is based on research. It took me two and a half years to put this book together. Not necessarily because I needed two and a half years, but trying to manage a family and work and do all of these things and write a book, you know, with, with this level of research, it, it's a lot. It took a lot. Two and a half years I worked on this. This is research, Islamically and otherwise, academically. He has a title, he has a chapter title called Adult Sons, Searching for mothering in other women. Listen to what he said. The man who hasn't got enough energy drags himself into the world trying to find a lover, partner, or wife who will compensate for what was lacking in his childhood. Or he will do whatever it takes to make himself forget what he didn't get, working, drinking, drugging, and accumulating. Men, I, I need the brothers to listen to this. All of you brothers who work long hours, all you brothers who drink and smoke, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive you and forgive us all. I'm not blaming anybody. We all have our vices. 
All right. We all have our vices. But for those of you Muslim men that are listening right now, you're struggling with smoking weed. You're struggling with sniffing coke. You're you're struggling with dump popping pills. Right. Whatever your drug of choice is, those of you who are struggling with drinking alcohol, those of you who are workaholics, who work, you know, 13, 14 hours a day, you're working overtime. What you sometimes what you don't realize is that all of what you are doing of this unhealthy behavior is trying to make yourself forget what you didn't get. Make yourself forget what you didn't get in your life from your mother. He goes on. He, the man deprived of emotional attention in his childhood, is almost always drawn to lovers who will, on the surface, appear to be nurturing, life-giving, offering him what his mother could not. Unfortunately for the man and his partner, even if she is able to actually give some of what he needs, he will never be able to let her get close enough to do so. Thus, the struggle begins. So this answers the question why a lot of you sisters, you got, you, you guys that are listening right now, if you are in a relationship with a man who almost comes off like a child in terms of the needs that he has emotionally. And sometimes you find yourself like a mother catering to him, his emotional needs constantly. And no matter how much you give him, he always finds a way to push you back or to push you away. And you're sitting here trying to figure out, well, what am I doing wrong? I'm catering to this guy. I'm giving him everything he asked for. I catered to him like he is my child. And yet, he still pushes me away. He can't let you get too close. He can't let you get too close. God forbid you get too close and you're able to psychoanalyze him and find out that the real issue is not that he is needy because he needs you as a wife, but he's needy because he needs you to be his mother. He needs you to be his mama. He is getting from you all of the things that his mother did not give him. That's a fact. And thus the struggle begins. So you banging your head up against the wall, trying to feel like, trying, trying to understand why in the world you're feeling so invalidated. You're giving this guy, you know, all that you can possibly give him and he still makes you feel like you are invalid you're not doing enough and you are on the roller coaster you're on the hamster wheel the more you give the more he takes the more he takes the more invalidated you feel and there are women who do this as well there are women who do this as well don't misconstrue but we're not talking about the women this is written from a man's perspective and try to get brothers to you know dig deeper than the surface to understand you know, the psychology that the drive that is behind this, you know, you know, I wrote this. So not so brothers would be turned off to polygyny, but brothers would think twice before they did it. Even when we look at the early life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right, we can see this mother son relational dynamic manifest very vividly. The Qur'an captured the human need for maternal attention, either biologically, adoptively, or otherwise. We need maternal attention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed the Prophet sallallahu about his early life as an orphan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam najidika yatiman fa'awa. Did we not find you as an orphan and we gave you shelter? Did we not find you as an orphan and we gave you shelter? I don't think that we stop long enough on that ayah to ponder and reflect about the cultural implications of this particular ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet sallallahu reminding him of his you know, upbringing. Did we not find you as an orphan? And he was an orphan. An orphan, a yatim in the Arabic language is... Any child whose father dies before the child reaches the age of puberty. That's called a yatim. 
Al Yatim is any child who dies before uh, any child whose father dies before he reaches the age of puberty. All right. And how does the Prophet Sallallahu fall into that category? Because his father, Abdullah, died. Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib, he died six months before he was born. That means that the Prophet Sallallahu never met his father. He never met his father. And think about this. Even during that time, they didn't have like pictures, drawings or whatever. So he probably didn't even know what his father looked like. Other than looking at Abu Talib and, you know, looking at uh, Abu Lahab and all of his other uncles, you know, to kind of get an idea of what his father used to look like. But that wasn't a culture where, like, that was more like the Romans and the Persians, the those who come from more advanced societies. These are nomads. They live in the desert with their camels. They don't, they're not advanced. They didn't even read and write. The Arabs during that time were not, they were not advanced nation. They were advanced in, in terms of, uh, science, sciences, right? They use the moon and the sun to calculate the days, the months, and, you know, they could travel through the desert and they knew their way around how to navigate. You know, they were advanced in terms of those type of sciences. But in terms of reading, writing, you know, art, you know, uh, um, you know, in, in different arts, different art forms, um, they were advanced in terms of poetry, but they were not advanced in, in terms of, you know, they used to buy their idols from outside of Arabia. They used to buy their idols. They used to travel to Syria and Damascus and other places, and they would buy idols and bring them back into Mecca. You understand? So they weren't advanced societies. So the Prophet wasallam was an orphan. He grew up without his father. Although born to his biological mother, Amina, Amina bintu Wahab, shelter in the form of maternal attention was given to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by women who were not necessarily his relatives. He was actually reared and breastfed by a number of women, many of whom he used to refer to as his mother, mom. He used to refer to as mom, showing you, you know, the closeness, you know, that he had to them, you know. There's some who, who um, she said that many brothers already know that they aren't in a position uh, to marry uh, multiple wives, uh, but they use their right. And here again, it's not a right. That's not their right to take on a second wife or third wife. That's not a right. Because a right would mean it is something that he is entitled to. He is not entitled to that. It's a ruhsa. It's an allowance that Islam gives provided the man meets a certain criteria. It's not a right. It's a ruhsa. It's an allowance. It's an allowance. If it was a right, there would not be any stipulations because it would be something that he is absolutely entitled to. You understand? And here again, we have to change our language in the Muslim community if we want you know, some of these things, you know, these problems to disappear, a large, a large part of the problems that are existing in our communities with regard to marriage is as a result of the thinking, which is the result of the thinking, the perspectives and the language that is, you know, codified to begin protecting these, you know, these misnomers and these misunderstandings. We start to create language that is connected to the misunderstandings that we have. You understand? If we want to start to clean up some of these misnomers, misunderstandings, we have to change the language. As long as you continue to use the language, the thought, the perspective will continue to exist. When you change the language, the perspective changes. Because perspective follows the language. We create an idea, and then we create language to manifest that idea in, 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 the, in our spaces. You change the language, you change the perspective, and thus you change your condition. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that Allah will not change the condition of a people until at first they change what is within themselves. The change starts with us. Stop using language that is indicative of our own sabotage. 
Stop using language that indicates, you know, our own dysfunction. It is not a right. It's not a right. Polygyny is not a right. Let me say that again. It is not a right. Because when you say that it's a right, then that means that the man can just go full into polygyny. He doesn't have to meet a certain criteria. He, there's no conditions. There's no shuru. There's no nothing. And that's not the case. There are conditions for a man marrying multiple women. And as a result of that, then that means that in order for him to engage in that, or partake in that, he has to meet those conditions, which means that it's not a right. It's not a right. Uh, let me let me let me let me give you an example to make it more clear. A dowry is the right of a woman. That's your right. Meaning you don't even have to ask for even if a woman does not ask for a dowry. Even if a woman does not ask for a dowry, the man is still obligated to give her what women in her society and her environment are normally given as a dowry. You understand? She doesn't even have to say she wants anything as a dowry. But the dowry still must be given because it is a haq, it is a right that she is entitled to. A woman does not have to ask for food, clothing, and shelter. She doesn't have to ask for that because that is a right that she is entitled to on GP of marrying her. By default of marrying her, she is entitled to these things, even if she doesn't stipulate it in a marriage contract or she doesn't ask for it. That goes without saying because it's a haq. You understand? That is what a right is. Something that you don't have to ask for. There are no conditions or stipulations. It is something that you are entitled to by default of your position. You understand? That's what a right is. That's a haq. Polygyny is not the man's haq. It's not his haq to marry multiple wives. He, it is an allowance that is afforded to him provided that he meets a certain criteria, that he meets you know, certain conditions. When there are conditions that are connected to something, it's no longer a right. It's a ruhsa. It is an allowance. So the Prophet Sallallahu was actually reared and breastfed by a number of women, many of whom he used to refer to as mom, showing you the connection that he has to these women, such as Um Ayman. Um Ayman, right? And her real name was Baraka. Baraka bintu Tha'laba. Baraka bintu Tha'laba. Um Ayman, who was the mother of Usama ibn Zayd. Right? Um Ayman, she was a black woman. She breastfed the Prophet. ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ used to refer to her as Ya Umma, O my mother. Not Umma with a tabra buta, Umma with a ha at the end of the meme. Alif with the hamza, meme and a ha. Not tabra buta. Umma with a tabra buta means nation. Umma means umma, my mother. It's like saying Ummi. Um Amen was a mother, was not related to him biologically, but she breastfed him. And he used to refer to her, refer to her as his mother. Fatima bin to Esed, his aunt, the wife of uh, uh, Abu Talib, he used to refer to her as his mother. And there were others who had a very profound impact on his childhood in terms of the cultivation and interpersonal relationships between the opposite sex, including Thuwayba al-Aslamiyya, the first woman to breastfeed him after his mother. She was the slave girl of Abu Lahab. Thuwayba al-Aslamiyya, she breastfed the Prophet Wasallam, as well as Halima al-Sa'diyya. Halima bintu Thuwayb al-Sa'diyya. So these were women who were the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was surrounded by. These were not even his, they were not related to him biologically. These were women who Abu Talib put him in the care of these women. 
Although not biologically related, these women still provided Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the maternal attention he needed in childhood, which would become the essential ingredients for a healthy social life in adulthood. As a result, it is possible that his pursuit of a polygynous lifestyle later on, in addition to its cultural acceptance, had a deeper meaning than mere political alliances and the satisfaction of unrestrained sexual urges as his critics assert. So the Prophet wasallam marrying into polygyny, I think it had a deeper meaning than just, you know, obviously it wasn't about him satisfying sexual urges because we're talking about a man who had nine wives at one time and he would go around and visit all of his wives in one night without having sex with them. So if, if him marrying multiple women was about satisfying his sexual appetite, then how is it that he is able to maintain such a strong level of sexual discipline and go around and visit all of his wives? I mean, just imagine a man in today's time with nine women, you know, that he had access to. He gonna go visit every single one. Like you got a man got one wife and he don't even text her. A whole entire day go by and he don't send her one text to find out how her day going, what she's doing, how she's doing, right? This is one wife. Just imagine a man having access to nine women in today's time and then he goes around to those nine women, right? Just to see how they're doing, take out the garbage, help them with anything, sit down and talk with them briefly. How's your day going? You know, I miss you, whatever. The but no sex. Him going around to visit his wife, as Aisha said, I mean, the lady Masis, without being intimate with them. Because intimacy has different levels. There's emotional intimacy, there's intellectual intimacy, there's sexual and physical intimacy, right? There are different levels of intimacy and relationships are not just all sexual, even in, in polygyny. It's not all sexual intimacy. There's intellectual intimacy, there's emotional intimacy, there's physical intimacy. Sometimes just being, you know, hugging one another and being up against one another. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she used to lay on the lap of the Prophet sallallahu while he's reciting Quran, while she's on her menstrual cycle. She's on her menstrual cycle, she's laying her head on his thigh, right? He's sitting up against the wall with his leg out like this, reading Quran, reading the Quran, and Aisha's laying her head on his lap while she's on her menstrual cycle. That's physical touch. It has nothing to do with, you know, uh, sexual intimacy. That's physical intimacy. Physical touch. And the Prophet Sallallahu you know, he exercised all levels of intimacy throughout his relationships. So this mother-son dynamic had such a profound impact on the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that he named his youngest daughter Fatima after Fatima bin to Asad. He named his youngest daughter Fatima after the woman who has such a profound impact on his life, his aunt, Fatima bin Tuesid, who was the mother of Ali bin Abi Talib. This was Ali's mother, Ja'far's mother, right? Fatima bin Tuesid. He used to call her his mom. And he named his youngest daughter after her, Fatima, a Zahra. And when Fatima bin Tuesid died, it had such an impact on the Prophet Sallallahu life. It was said that the Prophet Sallallahu daughter Fatima reminded him so much of her in the way that she would cater to him maternally during the Meccan period of persecution and oppression. And that he nicknamed Fatima Um Abiha. Um Abiha. Meaning... You are your father's mother, meaning you are to me, Fatima, like my mother is to me, meaning Fatima bin to Esid, not his biological mother, his aunt, whom he used to refer to as his mom. Do you guys see the connection here? You see the connection? He referred to his daughter as Um Abiha. You are your father's mother, meaning you cater to me, right? You cater to me like my mother caters to me. Because that was something that the Prophet Sallallahu absolutely he required. He required that level of nurturing, that level of catering. Mothers are the ones who introduce the experience of love into the lives of their sons. A mother's love for her son is the most constant expression of what a woman represents to a man to such an extent that the perception 
that many men have of women in their adulthood is largely influenced by what their mothers demonstrated in the home during their childhood. I'll say that again. A mother's love for her son is the most constant expression of what a woman represents to a man. Meaning how you engage your sons, you mothers that are listening right now, how you engage your sons is eventually going to become the expectation that your son has of his wife or of the women that he engages with in his life later on. Because you have now set the barometer, you know, you set the bar for him. You set the bar for him in your interaction with him that now how you engaged him now becomes the expectation that he has of other women in his life later on when he becomes an adult. A mother's love for her son is the most constant expression of what a woman represents to a man to such a, an extent that the perception many men have of women in their adulthood is largely influenced by what their mothers demonstrated in the home during their childhood. So if you see a young boy who is disrespectful towards women, you see a young boy who is disrespectful towards women, he specifically targets women with his disrespect. I am a teacher, so I see it in the classroom. I see it in the classroom. This boy, he will never say what he just said to this girl to another boy, but he'll say it to a girl. He thinks that boys are better than girls. He thinks that boys, you know, dominate girls in every sport. He thinks that certain sports are only for girls. Very demeaning, very disrespectful, very belittling towards girls. You know why? You know why he does that? Two reasons. Either because he hates his mom. Because she shows him no attention. She's very harsh, very rough with him, very rigid, right? And is not able to pinch off enough of herself emotionally to give him. And that might be because, here again, somebody who doesn't have something can't give what they don't have. Perhaps the mother is emotionally drained. Perhaps the father is the cause of that. <laughs> Perhaps her father is the cause of that. Sometimes a woman goes into a marriage with a man and she's so emotionally depleted because of her own biological father. She doesn't even have enough emotion to show her own husband, much less her own sons. She's depleted. She has just enough emotion to cater to her own needs, to lick her own wounds. She doesn't have enough for anybody else. So sometimes as boys, we're growing up and we wonder why our mothers are so rough, so rigid, so harsh. And that's probably because their mothers were the same to them. Their mothers were emotionally depleted. You know, grandma, grandpa, you know, cheated on grandma, beat grandma, left grandma a thousand times and came back. And by the time grandma, you know, had our mothers, grandma was emotionally depleted. So our mothers had to, you know, fend for themselves. They had to figure it out. And then that was passed on to us. We don't realize that how deep the cycle, how far back the cycle goes. We just blame our mothers and criticize our mothers for not being there for us emotionally. But we don't realize that the reason why your mother was not there for you emotionally is because her mother wasn't there for her emotionally. You understand? You got to go back. <laughs> if you want to solve that trauma puzzle you got to go back and you got to remove all of the pieces from the board and begin putting them things back together so that you have a clear picture. Either because the mom doesn't show him any attention or the mom shows him too much attention and the boy doesn't see his mother as his mother. He sees his mother as his sister or friend. You ever see, you know, some women, they have like this friendship with their their children. It's more like their friends than they are, you know, mother-son relationship. It's not a mother-son relationship. It's a, you know, friend and friend relationship. Don't be friends with your children. Your children are not your friends. 
always maintain that mother son that father daughter relationship man i'm not your friend don't talk to me like you talk to your friends i have boundaries i am an adult you understand you don't just walk in my room without knocking on my door you don't just grab my cell phone because you know my password and just tap buttons and start going scrolling through my cell phone. You don't go through my pictures and start scrolling through my pictures. I am an adult. There are boundaries that I have and you have to respect those boundaries. Some parents, especially young parents, you think that's cute. That, oh, my, my daughter has my cell phone. My daughter has my tablet. She always has my... That's not cute. Because you're giving your children unrestricted access to some things that are personal in your life. You just allow your children to walk in and out of your bedroom. What happens when you get married and your husband is in the room getting dressed and because you have an open door policy with your children, your husband is getting dressed and one of your children just walk into the room and see your husband, you know, dressed inappropriately. Appropriate for him, but inappropriately for the child. Because this was something that you allowed. Because you didn't put up any boundaries. Because you were too busy being your child's friend rather than being a parent. You're too busy being the child's friend instead of being the child's parent. As adults, we have boundaries. That's what makes us adults. That's what makes our relationship with people outside of ourselves healthy. Because there are boundaries. And you don't get to just tread on, you know, my terrain without, you know, yielding at the boundaries that I put up. Yeah, man. So by watching their mothers, young boys tend to learn a lot about the emotional framework of women. They begin to recognize the range of emotions that women experience and how they use those emotions to connect with others. This contributes to shaping the psychosexual development of their sons, which they will reference later on in their experiences with other women. Hear this out. The pros and cons to this mother-son relationship are many, and the absence of a more finite balance can leave a lasting void that men will spend the rest of their lives trying to satisfy. In many instances, when the mother is too emotionally attached to her son, he runs the risk of becoming a mama's boy. Let me say that again. Let me say that again. When the mother is too emotionally attached to her son, he runs the risk of becoming a mama's boy. In the same book that I referenced earlier, John Lee, he referred, the author of the book, he referred to this in his book as attachment disorder. Write that down. Attachment disorder. Where mothers live vicariously through their sons, creating codependent men who find it difficult to secure their own independence even when there is a woman involved in their lives. This happens a lot in the Arab community. The Arab and Desi community happens a lot. I'm just being honest because in their communities, their scholars, their sheikhs, their imams, their molas, you know, molanas, they're not going to talk about this stuff. Not going to talk about this stuff. See, in the African American community, alhamdulillah, one of the beauties of being an African American is that you can, you're, when you listen to African American speakers and, you know, preachers and sheikhs and imams, you're going to get a variety, you're going to give a, get a variety of talks and addresses across a broad spectrum of issues. We don't, we don't, there are not things that we don't talk about in our community. And that's a, that's the beauty of being African American. Our scholars, our imams, our preachers and teachers, there is no subject that is off limits to us. It might be off limits because the, the scholar or imam or student of knowledge may not feel qualified to talk about it. May not feel qualified to talk about it. 
or may feel uncomfortable talking about it because, you know, maybe he's a product of the same behavior. But there is no subject that is off limits. So when I, you know, speak about different cultures and I pull different cultures into the conversation, that's not me singling out Arab men. This is not me singing, singling out uh, Daisy men, because if they're honest with themselves, they'll they'll attest to this as well. I've had many conversations with many Arab brothers, many uh, Daisy brothers, and they attest to this. I had a Pakistani brother who bought this book and said that he hid the book in the in in the glove compartment of his car because he didn't want to take it in his house and have his wife believe that he was interested in the second wife. But he said the material was on point. He hid the book in the glove compartment of his car because he didn't want to take it in the house and his wife find it and think that he's interested in the second wife. No, he's not interested in the second wife, but he's interested in the material, the content, the content. And there are a lot of Arab men who are like that. The first time they get into an argument with their wives, they run straight to their moms. Mom has... You know, unlimited influence over him as it relates to how he interacts and engages with his wife. There are no boundaries between him and his mother. His mother can talk about his wife. His mother can say things to him about his wife and he will never check his mother. And then we'll use, well, respect for the mothers. No, respect is a double, is, is a, is a two-way street. Respect is a two-way street. And I'm not saying that a man should ever disrespect his mother, but a man should never sit in the company of his mother when she is being disrespectful to his wife. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that when you walk past a group of people and they are engaging in frivolous speech, anhum hatta, uh, uh, until they turn away from them, until they change their speech. Turn away from them until they change their speech. So if you're sitting in the presence of your mother and she's backbiting your wife, then she is engaging in frivolous, false, vain speech that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. Turn away from that speech until she turns to a different theme. You ain't got to be disrespectful, but you can tell your mom with all due respect, I'm not going to sit here and listen to you berate my wife with all of these accusations when, you know, talk about my wife behind her back. I'm going to turn away from this conversation until you turn to a different theme. As Allah instructs us in the Quran. Mothers are included in that as well. Mothers are not impervious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands. But to sit there and say, well, you know, but that's my wife. But, you know, Umi, that's my wife. No. Mama, that's that's my wife. No, you don't get to disrespect the mother of my children. You don't get to disrespect. You don't get to talk to my wife like that. Somebody, I made a commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, no, you don't get to do that. You don't get a pass. I don't care who you are. You don't get a pass. When uh, Abu Sufyan, you know, went to go visit uh, his daughter, Um Habiba, who at this time was married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He went to Medina to go visit his daughter. His daughter is now married to his arch nemesis, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Sufyan walks into the home and sits down in the place that is reserved for the Prophet Sallallahu We know as men, we all got that special spot on the couch or that special spot at the dining room table. That's our spot. That's my spot. My wife protects that spot. So Abu Sufyan walks into the home and he sits down in the place that is reserved for the Prophet Sallallahu Um Habiba tells him, you can't sit there. You, you don't get to disrespect my husband. You don't get to wage war against my husband, you know, under the banner of Quraysh. You don't get to wage war against my husband and then come into his hole and sit in a spot that is reserved for him. You can't sit there. Right? She checked her father. You can't sit there. I don't get to disrespect my husband, wage war against my husband, and then walk into his house and sit in his spot. you got to be kidding me. You don't get to sit there. And Abu Sufyan looked at his daughter and said, you know, evil has befallen you since you left my home. You talk to your father like that? 
She said, no, khair has befallen me. Good has befallen me since I found Islam in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No, rather the opposite. <laughs> contraire. <laughs> oh, contraire. No, good has befallen me since I found Islam in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So John Lee referred to this in his book as attachment disorder. Look it up, you know, familiarize yourself with some of these, you know, uh, with these terms so you can go back and do some research on your own to, you know, do some inventory, personal inventory to make sure that, you know, you are not falling into this. Attachment disorder where mothers live vicariously through their sons creating codependent men who find it difficult to secure their own independence even when there is a woman involved in their lives. So that's one end of the spectrum where the woman is smothering her son and she creates a codependent man who can't think or act or make decisions for himself without his mother's approval. If you have a man in your life right now that fits that particular profile, there's a strong possibility that the reason why he is like that refers everything, defers everything back to his mother. Got to check in with his mother about everything. He is codependent on the approval of his mother, even down to marrying you. Before he could even marry you, he had to get his mother's approval codependent on the approval of his mother nine times out of ten the result that is the result of the mother smothering him attachment disorder the mom doesn't know how to take him off her breasts he is an eternal breast feeder on the other hand now let's look on the other end of that spectrum if the mother is too distant or emotionally detached, the son has the potential to become a cold-hearted player. He finds himself emotionally unavailable in just about every relationship he enters. This is the third phase of the predictable sequence of behavior as described by psychologist uh, John Bobley, uh, uh, Bobley. He stated, this boy grows into a man who favors objects, collecting more and more material possessions. He will treat people as objects and find it difficult to develop deep and lasting relationships, even with his own children. It is as if he draws sustenance from the things that he accumulates. The fear of not accumulating them causes him more despair than the thought of not having a wife or family to come home to at the end of a hard day. If you have a man in your life right now who cares more about collecting things, whether that is money, that's cars, that's sneakers, video games, he cares more about collecting things, accumulating material possessions than he does his relationship with you or even with his own children, then a lot of times this is the result of this man growing up underneath a woman who was emotionally detached from him. So he's drawing his emotional sustenance from, you know, material collection and accumulating material things in his life. The marital institution of polygyny in the Islamic tradition is by far one of the most controversial and misunderstood relationships of our time. Surprisingly enough, even more than same-sex marriages. I'll say that again. The marital institution of polygyny in the Islamic tradition is by far one of the most controversial and misunderstood relationships of our time, surprisingly enough, even more than same-sex marriages. Do you guys agree with that? Meaning, we have an acceptance. We have a general acceptance of same-sex marriages to such a degree that we will just say Islamically that it's haram, you know, these people are going to the hellfire, blah, blah, blah. But we will never invest 
any more into the discussion about same-sex marriages. But let the subject of polygyny come up. Oh, we'll open up a whole chapter on how stupid the woman is, uh, how belittling it is, how sex crazy a man is, and how much you would never do this, and how stupid people are to even do that. We'll open up a whole chapter of conversation about polygyny. But let same-sex marriage come up, and we don't really have much to say about that. It's like, yeah, it's haram, you know, these people that, you know, but I, you know, I reserve, you know, the right to allow people to be who they want to be, right? It's so hypocritical, right? It's so hypocritical. And we're talking about Muslims here. When the subject of same-sex marriage come up, a Muslim will always go back to the default position or the politically correct position of, oh, that's their choice. You know, people can choose to be whatever they want to be and whoever they want to be and marry whoever they want. You know, I, I, I don't judge. Right. That's that's our default politically correct position. But let a person say they're marrying into polygyny. Oh, we are overly opinionated about that, how stupid they are, and why would you do that, and this is, <laughs> isn't that haram, like, you got Muslims who will tell you that polygyny is haram in America, it's haram in America for you to marry more than one wife, it's haram in America for you to marry more than one wife legally, not even haram, it's illegal, <laughs> I don't even want to use the word haram. Because it's not a Islamic ruling. It's not a, a Islamic law. <laughs> Islamic law permits it. <laughs> Our judicial law here in America pro prohibits it. So it is illegal for a man to marry more than one wife legally. But if you are marrying according to the dictates of your religion, it is not illegal. You have Christians that are fighting, you know, different sects of Christianity that practice polygyny themselves, Mormons and other than them who practice polygyny, that are fighting to institute legislation that would give them permission to practice this. While Muslims, we would stand on rooftops and shout at the top of our lungs about how wrong it is for a Muslim man to marry more than one wife. The hypocrisy of the Muslim community, man. And this is one of the reasons why I never wanted to speak about polygyny publicly. I never wanted to speak about polygy polygyny publicly because of the hypocrisy of the Muslim community. We're okay with same-sex marriages. Not okay in the, in, the, in the sense that we condone it, but we, we don't have an opinion about it. Our opinion is if two, if two men or two women want to get married, then you know who am I to judge, right? We opt out. We don't, we don't have a dog in that fight. We don't have nothing to say about it. We reserve our right to you know not judge. But let two Muslims, two Muslims, who want to marry into polygyny, or let a Muslim who Muslim woman who wants to marry into polygyny, or Muslim man who wants to you know marry take on another wife. Everybody has an opinion on how stupid they are, how idiotic they are, and how you know this goes against societal norms and to the end of it. That's the hypocrisy of our ummah. Got five minutes left and I'm done. As of recent, discussions are reverberating both within the Muslim community and without about the practicality and necessity of polygyny in a more postmodern world. Some, even within the American Muslim community, view polygyny as a primitive tradition of the past that has no place in a civilized society, labeling those who engage in this practice as archaic and progressively deprived. Others suggest that polygyny can in fact become a more civil institution congruent with the modernity of American culture once it's sanitized through the process of human modification. In March of 2006, there was an HBO feature on the issue of polygyny called, drum roll please, Big Love. 
In 2006, there was an HBO feature on the issue of polygyny called Big Love, which many of you sitting here, listen, you were avid watchers of that series. There was another one in 2010 called Sister Wives, which aired on the TLC network. Some of you sitting here listening right now know exactly what I'm talking about. I had to do research on this. Uh, i kind of seen stuff in commercials, but I personally never watched uh, you know, an episode of it. Nonetheless, after doing my research, I had to go back and watch it myself before I could write about it. The show documented the life of, polygamous fa of a polygamous family, which included patriarch Cody Brown, his four wives, and their 17 children. This was one of many attempts to introduce polygyny to the postmodern world through the civility of Christianity, right? Right, because the only way that America, American society will welcome polygyny is that it got to be sanitized through Christianity. Christianity has to sanitize it. <laughs> right. As long as has been sanitized and whitewashed by Christianity and, and, and white folks who get their stamp of approval, then it's accepted. And then and only then will Muslims jump on the bandwagon and say, well, we have polygyny in Islam. It's like, dude, please spare me. We have polygyny in Islam. When have you ever been an advocate of polygyny in Islam? Even if you nece didn't necessarily want it for yourself. But when have you ever ad advocated for polygyny? When have you ever even spoken in favor of polygyny from an Islamic standpoint? But when white people do it, when uh, a popular culture and American society accepts it, then we want to say, oh, well, we have that in Islam. It's like, please stop. Stop it, man. Stop it. You're making yourself look foolish. It's the same thing with wearing a beard. You know, Philly, shout out to Philly. Philly Muslim men have been wearing beards for the longest, right? When I first took my shahada in 1997, I hit the streets in 1999, you didn't see Muslims with beards like that. You go to Philly, everybody in Philly, including non-Muslim men, wearing beards. It was very popular. That's one of the things that I can say about Philly is that they don't make any bones about their culture as Muslims. And part of the problem with that, with many Muslims from Philly, is that that's all it is, is cultural Islam minus the spirituality, right? You got the beard, you got the thobe, you got the kufi, you got the jilbab, you got the, you know, the overgarment, you got the fly overgarments, pocketbooks, and all of that. But you're fighting at the Eid. You punch another Muslim in the face. You shoot a Muslim, you know, in front of a masjid, right? So it's minus the spirituality. The culture is there, but the spirituality is, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, restore the spirituality to the spirits, the hearts, and the souls of the Muslims all around the globe. Because we are moving so far away from, you know, the spiritual teachings of Islam. We got the culture down pat. You know, we got the culture down pat. You know, the thobe, the beard, the look, the swag, the slang. You know, we, we got all of that. But the spirituality, something as simple as, you know, giving salams to your Muslim brother or sister as you pass them by. Something as simple as that we're, we're missing. Much less, you know, the, 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 the sanctity of the blood of a Muslim. <laughs> the sanctity of the blood of a Muslim. SubhanAllah Allah be Anyway, one thing that you can say about Muslims from Philly is that they make no bones about their their culture as Muslims. They wear a thobe, it doesn't matter where. They go to job interview with a thobe on, they wear a niqab, you go to any job site, you can go to the hospital, you'll see niqabis, you know, working in the hospital with their jibbab on, with their niqab on. They make no excuses unapologetically Muslim. But people weren't rocking beers like that in, in the late 90s, early 2000s. People weren't rocking beers like that until it became popular amongst the non-Muslims. It became popular amongst the non-Muslims. Then Muslims want to start wearing beards and we jump on the bandwagon. It's the same thing with polygyny. SubhanAllah. 
At the same time, this tradition has been unces unceasingly demonized and viewed as divisive to the social order of monogamy when introduced as a marital institution legislated in the religion of Islam. A highlighted polygyny as, uh, as a religious institution of marriage in order to distinguish it from the traditional practices found in ancient societies as well as many contemporary cultures. Within such societies, polygyny was and is practiced without a divine order, per se. Interesting en uh, interestingly enough, polygyny has appeared throughout history in almost every corner of the world, such as ancient Hebrew societies, where it was moderately accepted. In ancient China, amongst traditional Native Americans, Africans, Polynesians, Indians, and ancient Greece, polygyny was practiced with little to no restrictions. This continued until the dawn of the Roman Empire and the reign of the Catholic Church, which superimposed monogamy as a global standard of marriage. I'm going to stop there because now we're going to go into the history of polygyny because many people think uh, that you know polygyny originated in Islam and it didn't. It didn't. I'm gonna. We're gonna go the next time we discuss next Tuesday, inshallah. We're going to talk deeply about you know uh, the historical, um, the historical uh, timeline of polygyny, and that it, it was a very common practice amongst many nations, you know, before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam emerged with the religion of Islam. As a matter of fact, Islam only came to restrict the number of wives that a man could have, but polygyny was being practiced way before. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emerged with the Dawah of Islam. All right, so alhamdulillah. So from the from the beginning, you can see as we're kind of slow walking through the introduction, is that we're talking about you know the the, the mother son relationship and how important that is, and the effects of the mother son relationship on the type of man you know this boy becomes later on in life, and how that could possibly influence his decision later on in life to take on another wife. And for women who are married to men, I want you to open up a deeper conversation with your husbands tonight, tomorrow, whenever you can. Ask him about his childhood. Ask him about his relationship with his mother. Go in deep because by doing that, it gives you a deeper understanding of why your relationship with him is the way that it is. Men are very simple. We are not complicated. By far, not as complicated as women are. It's just that some women just kind of look at a man and it's like, all right, I'll marry him and that's it. You know, and I'll figure, you know, what he likes, what he likes to eat, what he likes to wear. And, you know, I'll figure out all the basic stuff about him, you know, as we move along through the marriage. But you got to peel back, you know, a few layers. You know, you got to go a little deeper to understand his psychology, why he thinks the way he thinks, why he moves the way that he moves, why he makes the decisions the way that he makes. There's, there's all the reason behind all of that. We, we are not complicated. It's just that some women just don't take the time out to figure them out. Don't take the time to figure them out. You just think that, you know, who they are will just eventually one day manifest and you'll have it all, you know, you'll solve that problem. Ask women who have been married, you know, for 20, 30 years, you know, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. And the beauty of figuring him out is that once you figure him out, you can pretty much predict everything that he's... We are very predictable as men. <laughs> we are very predictable as men. <laughs> you can predict our next move by understanding, you know, our psychology, why we think the way we think, why we move the way we move. You know exactly what our next move is going to be. So with that being said, inshallah ta'ala, we'll stop here. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam at taslim in kathira. Wa akhiru da'wana bin alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. The revolution of love, a man's perspective on loving multiple women in a non-traditional marriage. We haven't even, we have just kind of skimmed through the first part of the introduction. Uh, in our next discussion, we're going to, we probably like a little bit, not even halfway through the uh, the introduction. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, societal norms. Uh, we'll talk about infidelity. We'll talk about societal norms. We'll talk about infidelity. And we'll talk about some other issues, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakum Allah khairan. Don't really have time for um, uh, questions and answers. 
Uh, if you have any questions, if you have any questions, inshallah ta'ala, you can forward them to me through email. Uh, or you can post them on uh, you can post them on social media and I'll do my best to answer them inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.